So in this uh, data site um, demo, we're just going to walk through some of the changes to the new um, toolkit or some of the features and functions of the new toolkit, talk about the ways it's different from the old one. Um, and of course, we'll leave some time for um, questions at the end um, or comments, uh, any kind of discussion you might want to have. Um, I'm going to keep everyone's mic muted for this demo. And I'm going to ask that um, you, any questions or thoughts you have, you chat into the, um, use the chat box below to um, record, place those questions. And um, Katie Bain, um, who's my colleague here at the ALA, will grab those and present those um, during the Q&A session. Um, and if later, you know, we want to get into a little more discussion, um, we can look into maybe turning some mics on for folks who want to um, talk directly. We'll see how things go. Okay. Um, so I'm showing you a slide right now, but I'm going to switch now to um, the, uh, the live site because I prefer to demo on the live site. So um, if you'll just bear with me for a moment. While I switch over to that, I'm going to change my screen here. Let's go to screen monitor one and let's expand this. All right, so now let's get started. Um, so this is the new beta site. It can be accessed in a couple different places. This is rdatoolkit.org. And of course, it can be accessed here through the blue button, Explore Toolkit Beta Site. It can be accessed through the regular toolkit through this button in the top blue banner. It says Explore the RDA Toolkit Beta Site. Um, or it can, of course, be accessed directly through its, um, its own URL, which is beta.rdatoolkit.org. Anyone can access the, access the beta site with a RDA subscription. If you do not have one, you can sign up for a 30-day free trial, and that will get you into both the current toolkit and into this beta site. So one of the changes we made to the toolkit was this uh, home page that you see here. Um, we added some er uh, different areas of information that we thought might be useful to people. Um, a new section this pulls from our browser. We hope to make this a little richer uh, going forward. And then we also have um, some information about recently updated instructions. You can see these are all glossary terms for now. Um, those were the most recent updates and we'll be um, working on making this a little more um, functional going forward. Um, I hear someone's mic on, so I'm just going to remind everyone I'm now muting everyone. And um, another important part about this home page is that um, this a little welcome message here. Just to clarify, um, this beta site is not authorized for use in cataloging work by the RSC. It is still very much a beta site. A work in progress. So it's not something you should be using um, at this present time to do um, your official cataloging work. So um, when you come to the toolkit, the new beta site, just like the uh, current toolkit, you can be logged in automatically through IP authentication, or you can log in with a um, username and password. For instance, I'm going to type in my username and password here. Um, I can remember it. That didn't work. What did I do wrong? Um, all right, it's not, it's fussing with me. <laughs> um, so I can use one of the changes we made is that, um, let me try one other attempt at a Login. There we go. That's what I was hoping for. Um, 
So what happens is this has logged me into my institutional subscription. So you can see my institution name here in the upper right, ALA. And um, you can see this, what was a light blue box, used to be this color, has flipped to dark blue. And it now says profile login. So this means I'm logged into the toolkit. I can browse and go to any of the um, um, instructions or areas of content that I want, but um, I'm not fully logged into my profile, which will allow me to do extra things um, such as access bookmarks and notes and um, other things that are either created by me or shared um, through my institution, et cetera, like that. So, um, you know, access documents, et cetera, like that. So it's it's the toolkit is much more powerful if you do create a, a profile and log into your profile. So here's my profile and I can log in now. And you can see it takes me into my uh, profile. So now it says, welcome back, James. It shows me the um, files that I've most recently viewed. It has my name up here, James Henley. I can go and manage my profile or I can log out. Now that's a double login that used to be, many people used to find annoying. So if I log out, I can come back and I can just use my profile name, Jay Henley and password in the first screen to do my login, to fully log in. So here I am logged in. Um, so the new site, I'm gonna kind of walk you through um, stuff that's going on here. Um, one of the main changes, of course, is the way we navigate through the toolkit. In the original toolkit, we uh, allowed navigation through what were called chapters. It was very much like a book. The chapters were organized kind of around a, a workflow. Now the um, approach is much more um, organized around um, entities and elements. Uh, and so it kind of functions like a, a kind of data dictionary, if you will. Um, a really enhanced data dictionary. So it's a little bit of a different experience. This first tab is entities, and you can see here listed are the RDA entities. They are in what we call our LRM order. LRM, of course, stands for Library Reference Model, but the new standard that came from IFLA that kind of succeeded or, or merged, if you will, FRBR and FRAD and FRSAD into a kind of more unified um, conceptual model that RDA is based upon. So it also involves a few new um, entities, including, say, nomen and place and time span. It also includes a, a super entity known as agent that has um, kind of sub-entities, person, collective agent, collective agent has sub-entities, corporate body, family. Um, and we can go into one of these, um, I'm kind of, well, I'll run across the tab bar real quick here and then we'll come back and start diving into things. Next we have guidance. Um, these are guidance chapters. These go into specific um, aspects of RDA and important concepts like diachronic works or data provenance, um, how RDA is now going to handle uh, fictitious and non-human appellations. Here's a discussion of what nomens and appellations mean, et cetera. Recording methods, this is a new concept I'll show you soon as part of the toolkit. And so there's um, instructions here on these kind of top level concepts as well as an introduction to RDA. Policies where are where policy statements will live. Um, there are no policy statements in the toolkit right now. Uh, we have some kind of uh, testing um, sample policy statements here, British Library policy statement, and LC, PCC policy statements. Those are just testing material um, that's still in development. And then the resources tab has some um, stuff that will be useful to you. There's the glossary. Vocabulary and coding schemes, relationship matrix. I'm going to show you these um, a little bit later so you can see exactly what they are. But um, for now, I'm just going to point them out. Uh, these, this middle section here, you see these are abbreviations, additional instructions for names, persons, etc. 
these are um, this is material that used to be in the appendices of the uh, or is in the appendices of the current toolkit. It's just been moved over here. We call these kind of related resources. And then you have non-RDA resources such as books of the Bible, terms for medium of performance, and AACR2. So you do get access to the online AACR2 with um, the beta site. I'll just click on that real quick. You'll have to log in again to access it. Um, oh, that wasn't in here. I'll do my other one. I have more luck with. All right, that's being fussy for me today. This is why it's a beta site, because it's fussy. Um, but basically, this is going to be your full run of AACR2 um, content. Um, it's not linked to, the only difference is it's not linked to RDA anymore. There are no cross links to RDA. Um, so jumping into entities, I want to go to work and we'll kind of start to see how the new toolkit is structured. Um, first, each page has a print button here. This will basically open up a PDF for you of the page. We'll download it for you and you can print from there. Next up, you have the uh, title of the page. In this case, it's work. This is a breadcrumb work. And um, each entity and element page will start with the definition and scope section. So you see that here. And then it'll be followed by a pre-recording section, which you see here. And as you scroll down, you'll see some different features. This uh, gray box is labeled an option. That means this is an option. This is something you can choose to um, follow or not. Um, it's kind of up to your discretion. You also see within this option, there's a link to application profiles. So if I click on the words application profiles, the link will respond as you'd expect by taking you directly there. The alternative here is if I click this little icon that's uh, an arrow pointing to the right, um, it'll pop up a preview of that link. So one of the things we got from um, users is they were tired of kind of clicking back and forth and jumping around a lot. So this is intended to give you kind of a preview of what's here, what's behind this link, and you can kind of decide if you want to go continue with it or not. And you can have multiples of these previews open at any one time. As you can see, they're kind of loading up um, all these different um, links. And then I just click the X to get, make them go away. This right rail space I'll, I'll talk about later, but this is where policy statements that we have, and that's, this is where they would appear. So um, next down, if you, uh, so going forward, the next sections are recording. This is, again, a standard header that you're going to see in all the element and editing pages, uh, element pages, and also the recording methods, which are here, recording unstructured description, recording a structured description, recording an identifier, recording an IRI. At the bottom of each page, you'll get um, either elements or related elements. So on the entity page, it'll be elements. And of course, there are a lot of elements associated now with uh, work. So you can click in here and do a type ahead if you're looking for a particular element. So I can do creator and it'll start to tell me, um, it'll start shortening the list for me. So I'm gonna go ahead and go to um, creator agent of work. This is an element page. So you can see now I'm in work and I'm in creator of element of work as the um, breadcrumb show. Again, you get your definition and scope. And then each element has what we call an element reference section. And you can set this to have it permanently open if you like. This is going to give you the IRI. It's going to give you the domain and the range of this particular element. Um, this, this particular element is what we call a relationship element. Um, it's going to give you some uh, alternate titles. Uh, and then here we also have Dublin core terms. Uh, a little mapping to Dublin Core, 
and we have MARC uh, bibliographic, and there'll also be MARC um, authority information too, where applicable. So um, one of the differences, key differences between this beta site and the um, current toolkit is that we do not um, have that big table of mapping MARC to RDA and RDA to MARC. Um, that table was just a big flat table that was, um, that is very difficult to update and maintain, and we want to get away from that situation. Um, but we haven't found a really good solution, a mapping solution yet, um, but that is a high priority for us. But we also know that um, these kind of mapping information is important to you, so we wanted to get something in there um, as kind of a uh, workaround for the time being. So our solution was, that we put these uh, mark mappings in. Um, we think we have them in order by field number and then subfield. Um, you can see there's a little dis um, indication of where um, this field uh, is appropriate for a structured description or if it's appropriate for an IRI or identifier type um, recording method, I should say. Um, so uh, that's one of the additions we've made here to deal with that. And of course, these are expandable and collapsible. Here's your report recording section. And then here uh, under recording, we have the, uh, again, this unstructured structured recording identifier and IRI. And one of the changes we made here was we added a new type of example, these recording method examples, which uh, basically take the same um, topic or same subject, I should say, and um, show it in each of the recording methods. So here you have an unstructured description, Kansas Geological Survey. Here you have a recording structured um, example, Kansas Geological Survey, with the VES source of Library of Congress. Here's an identifier with its source. And then here's an, an IRI from this one's from the L, um, Library of Congress as well. So these are kind of showing off, um, so you can kind of get a sense of how the different recording methods um, will impact uh, your work. We also added a couple other new types of examples. Um, one is the relationship example. This is kind of a graph of a linked data um, experience. So you have a, a verbal statement of what's being shown here. Bern, Switzerland, uh, Canton, and then Notariat Gazettes has creator, Bern, Switzerland, Canton, um, creator of uh, work. So, um, and then here, this is shown graphically where you have the um, subject has, um, this is the predicate, the arrow indicates the predicate, and then the orange box indicates the um, object of it. And the um, predicate is linked to the RDA registry. It's linked because we control this one. Um, the other two are links that we do not control, so we cannot maintain them. And then next up is a uh, viewing context example. Here we're trying to pull together um, related pieces of data that might go into a, a record and um, showing how they, giving you a sense of how they all might relate to each other. Um, the particular um, element that you're looking at is highlighted, bolded, and um, I should say bolded and, and um, in blue here on the side so you know which uh, piece of information you're um, reading about. And then finally you have related elements including broader terms, narrower terms, etc. and they're all cross-linked here. As you can see this one has a rather extensive list. Um, at the bottom of the page you can see we added a document date so this has been this um, file was last updated, and here's the citation URL for this page. Okay. Um, oh, also we have these navigation buttons at the bottom. So this is the previous um, term, and this is the next term. Uh, I should say previous element and next element within the work um, browse. 
Right now, all of these elements are organized alphabetically underneath their entity. Um, and that may seem a little odd to some folks and not really relevant, um, but the presence of these buttons, um, these previous to next buttons will allow us to do more useful things going forward. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit later. Um, so next up, I just want to mention um, policy statements. So you can see here is the little policy statement box and you can click here and show policy statements. So you can pick which ones you want to see. It's only showing the two that are listed here, but you can eventually you'll be able to choose exactly what policy statements you want to see. And then you click one. And what will happen with these policy statements is that, like I said, they will appear just as these do, these uh, preview buttons do in the right rail and they'll appear at the exact point that they're referencing. So if this um, was a, a policy statement about say pre-recording or about say it was about recording, they'd actually line up a little lower and be right at that recording level. Um, it will like this, it will be scrollable. It'll show you the entire text of the particular policy statement and it'll allow you to click through and go to the um, what we call the mirror page of where the policy statements um, are in the center position on the uh, display. So you can see them in a fuller, easier to read um, display. So that's coming. And my hope is that we, when we do a release in December, we might have some functioning. They won't be policy statements that you can apply, but there'll be some active policy statements that you can at least see and understand how the function will work. OK. Um, next, I want to go to um, search. So we did a couple different things with search. The default position here is all. You know, actually, before I go to search, I want to do a quick um, run through the glossary now and um, these other um, resource features, because they're really RDA content. Um, so here's the glossary. It is scrollable. You'll notice um, on all our pages, when you um, scroll down, a little a, uh, arrow appears in the lower right. And that's your back to the top arrow right there. You can always click and go right back up to the top. And this may become important in the glossary because as you move through it, it will, um, the navigation, um, there it goes you know, will drop off, the, the alphabet bar will drop off. So you can hit that arrow to go right back up to the top if you need to. My go to meeting thing is in my way of the arrow, so I can't hit it easily. There we go. Um, the definitions all include um, links to the actual files, the instructions on those topics where applicable. Um, it also it usually includes the inverse obviously includes the definition and it also you'll see C references here as well or use for references etc all in here the um, inverses you'll notice a little orange underline on them that means you can click on those and instead of having to re-navigate to the inverse you can just see it right there a lot of the inverses are kind of close together like in this case but there are several that are farther apart so this might be a useful tool um, going forward. Okay. The um, vocabulary and coding schemes is a list of vocabulary, is a collection of vocabulary lists um, used in the toolkit. So I can choose to go into, say, um, fonts, or let's go to content type. That will be a little richer. And this gives me a full list of all the different content type. Um, vocabulary terms that I can use, including with um, scope notes and definitions, etc. And related terms as well. So these exist for all of the um, all of these, um, all the all the elements that have vocabularies. And if you go to the vocabularies um, themselves, let's try this. You'll see that under um, recording a structured description, that same vocabulary list is there. 
And again, you'll see the little orange underline, and that just means you can get the pop-up definition right there without having to uh, navigate away. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to show you under this resources is, is uh, the relationship matrix. So this is where um, we move the, uh, what we're called the relationship designators. So there are no relationship designators in the beta site. There are relationship elements. And these are organized by domain and then range. So you go down this list and you can pick your element um, domain. And then you can choose from the list um, the range you want to use. So if I go to place and I go place to corporate body, it'll give me a list of um, relationship elements for this domain and range. Um, this resource is um, the relationship matrix isn't really working out the way we hoped and we need to find a better solution. So this hasn't been updated recently. Um, and we're really looking for a, a new solution that's going to become probably one of our top priorities for the next uh, in the next um, six months or so is to come up with a good solution for the relationship matrix or alternative approach. So that's in the works. Um, OK, now I'm going to go to search. And I'm going to start with all. So search works. Um, Pretty much like it, it, it has worked in the current toolkit, um, you can, instead of having the, we used to have the quick search, which searched just RDA, this new, and then we had an advanced search where you, it took you to a different page that had a really complicated uh, menu of different filters and, and et cetera that you could apply to your search. Now we just have one search box, it searches everything or you can choose to restrict it to just RDA instructions or just policy statements or just the glossary or just contributed documents. Um, contributed documents are documents created by users and, and shared on, on the toolkit. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, and then we also have the exact title search. The exact title search is if you know exactly the element or entity or um, basically a guidance chapter you're looking for, you just you choose exact title and you type it in, it'll take you right there. So exact title, I did that with um, when I did content type. I choose exact title and it takes me right there. Now, if I had done that same search with all, I get a hit list. So that's the difference, exact title takes you right there. So you can see the um, search, search content and type I can um, filter, I can refine search by adding more terms here if I want to this. Um, I can also change my display results to short by um, short, sort by relevance. Um, the uh, display list here is going to give you RDA documents first. It's going to show you the first 10 hits gets, of, and you can see it's 10 of 125. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Didn't mean to do that. There we go. Within the hits, you can see um, the title of the um, page it wants to take you to. You can see what type of page it is. So this is the vocabulary and coding schemes page when it was last updated. Um, here's content type. Again, here's the element content type. And this gives you a little taste of um, the um, information in the um, in the file, so you get a little tease of um, the content. One of the things you might notice here is that 6.9. What that's a hidden piece of uh, metadata that shows up in the search that tells you this use this is related to what used to be 6.9 in the um, original toolkit instruction numbering. There are a few of the instruction numbers in there. You won't find a lot of them, but if you have a favorite instruction number, you can search it. I'll sh I'll show that to you in a little bit. Um, you'll see glossary term. So these are all kind of designated so you kind of have a better sense of what exactly this type of hit that you have here. And then you can choose to see more results. Um, 
And then, of course, here's some hits on policy statements. We did have a couple of fake policy statements for carrier types. You can see those. So it's showing two of two. And it would show hits on contributed documents if they were there. Um, again, you can filter this. I can filter this for just, um, say, hits on elements. So I just knocked it down to 10 um, from 120 to 47. Or I can go back to all. Um, I can choose to, you know, filter my policy statements as well. So I could just do BLPS. And you can see it took them all away. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, and then you can do the same with contributed documents as well. And you can save this search if you like. You can save searches. Um, the other feature on the um, search is that you, of course, can search using um, uh, uh, quotation marks to, to search a phrase, say, like language of content. Um, so you can see you get hits there, and that searches the whole phrase and not just doesn't break up the words. Uh, search does not support Boolean operators, so all the so don't use Boolean operators. All the search it just treats everything as an AND type search. This helps with say searches like scale not given returning positive results, although that did not. It should have. I think this site hasn't been updated yet with those recent tweaks because we made a recent tweak to the search that fixed that. So, um, but that's why we're not using Boolean operators right now. Um, other things you can do include, uh, you can search by mark field. So I can put in 546 and I get five hits. So I know um, here are some um, elements that are related to the 546 field. And I can even be more specific. I can use my phrase and do 546 dollar sign A. And and get accessibility content. So I can get more specific hits on my mark fields. And again, as I mentioned before, you can actually search old instruction numbers if you know one and um, are interested in it. I can put in 742 and I get hits on longitude and latitude, et cetera. So those are some of the features with, um, with searching. Um, next up, I want to show you um, some of the other kind of unique um, approaches that we're taking with the beta site. So I'm going to type in um, preferred name. Oh, you have to bear with me. I'm not a good typist. Um, and I'm going to do exact title search. Oh, I put in an unnecessary quotation mark there. That was my problem. Let's try that again. Preferred name, there it is. There it goes. OK. So um, one of the changes we made is we kind of took out, there were a lot of um, if then type statements in the um, current toolkit. And we're switching these to kind of a condition option approach. And this is um, how uh, this is an example of one of those. Um, so you see an option here. And when you see an option just by itself, no associated condition, that just means this is an option. You can choose to follow this or not. When you have a conventional, when you have a condition and an option, um, this really means if you have this situation described in the condition, then you can choose to apply this option. And you'll see here this particular condition has kind of two statements. It says a corporate body has a real or official name and a conventional name. A corporate body is frequently identified by a conventional name and reference sources in a language of the corporate body. So these two conditions should be treated as and. So the whole condition means that both these statements um, are true, and then you can choose to um, follow this particular option. All right. Um, I also want to show you at this point some of the other um, features that we've added to the toolkit. So one is if I choose to highlight a piece of text, I get this little pop-up bar. 
And what this does is allows me to do several different things within this space. Now, if I were not logged into a profile, I would only see the create link and citation number options. But because I am in a profile, I can also add a new bookmark or add a note. Now, bookmark, if I click that, will ask you to give a title to the bookmark. And I'm going to just give it test, um, test 24. And I can organize it into folders. And I'll show you in a little bit um, how you can now organize bookmarks into kind of folder sets. And it also asks if you want to receive no notifications when this page is updated. So if you put a bookmark on a page and this page changes, it may impact your bookmark. So um, you could get a notification from, if you agree to this, you can get a notification from us that the page with your bookmark has changed and you might want to go and look and reevaluate. So I'll click here. And now you can see the bookmark has been added here. And you can see it has name test 24. I can also add a note here. Now a note is a bookmark that also allows you to add text. So I can add the bookmark and I can add um, a title and a note I can decide to share um, locally or keep private. So sharing locally means everyone within my institution or my subscription can see this um, particular note or bookmark. Again, I can add a folder and I can add text to it because it's a, um, because it's a note. So, and then again, I can also choose to get notifications if the page changes. And then I click save and here's what the note icon looks like. And again, if I click on it, I see the title and I see my note and I can see the sharing level too. This is private. That means only I can see it. So um, the other two um, tools we can use are the link tool, create link tool. So here, if I um, highlight conventional name, click create link, I get a link to this particular spot. I hit copy, it's copied to my clipboard. And if I open a new tab and paste it in, you can see it takes me right there. So um, now, if I want to get a citation number, citation numbers, um, some of you may have heard, and some of you may feel that we should have taken away the instruction numbering we had in the original toolkit. This was the decision we made for production um, reasons and for um, flexibility to um, make changes to the toolkit. Um, but uh, I make changes to the, I mean, not to the toolkit, but to the standard, to the organization of instructions, et cetera, without having to create um, a huge hornet nest of numbering problems as a result. But we also saw that there was a need to have um, some kind of um, human uh, readable, expressible uh, number uh, method to um, tell people about citations through print or uh, uh, verbally or some way. So we came up with citation numbers and those are accessed here. You just click on that and there'll always be this um, eight digit, two, um, four pairs of two digit numbers separated by dots. Um, these are all randomly generated, these citation numbers and they're all permanent. So you can take this citation number, you copy it if you remember, I highlighted condition for this. Um, and then if I take that same number, if someone gives me that number and I put it into um, my search box, it'll take me right to that spot. So here we are, and it highlights the area that, of that search. Um, so this number will always work forever and ever. It'll never... <laughs> be changed. It might get deprecated. If the number gets deprecated, then when you put it into search, that means if this inst if this instruction got deleted and you put that um, random, um, that citation number into the toolkit, it would take you to a message saying that this text is no longer um, part of the, um, part of RDA. Something to that effect. I haven't worked that out yet. 
but also um, these citation numbers are kind of put at different spots, kind of permanently fixed at different spots. They're fixed at um, headers and all conditions and all options have citation numbers and all kind of headers like this have citation numbers. So I could go here to option, get the citation number and it's a different number, copy it and say, go back to here, close that out. Paste it in here. I'm going to put this on all. And it's going to take me right to the option. So it's citing specifically the option. So you can do citations at the condition level, option level, and at the um, header level as well. OK. Um, so now I'm going to move to some of the other another toolbar that's at the very top here. So um, here's the submit feedback button, by the way. Um, you can click on that and give us feedback on the beta site. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but we're still collecting feedback and happy to hear from you. Um, I already talked about the manage profile button. Logout is here. English, this is where right now the toolkit, the beta site is only available in one language, English, but this is where you could change your language setting if you'd like. You could um, change site language refers to the um, user interface of the toolkit, these buttons up here, et cetera, like that. Um, you set that language or you can change the language of the RDA content, the, lang the language you see in here in the middle. Um, so you have options. You can do a quick change for those, or you can go to your views. I'll show you that in a little bit and make a permanent change to your language preference setting. You can also change your um, font size here to large. And you might be saying you should have done that earlier because this looks a lot better now. Um, and um, I should mention at this time that that's one of our initial accessibility steps. We are completing a full accessibility um, evaluation of the site. And with our August release, I think late August, we'll do an update to the beta site. And at that time, um, we expect it to be fully compliant with um, AA, with the AA rating uh, of um, the WCAG standard. So um, we're excited to have that. Um, to meet that um, goal. Help will give you um, uh, explanations of different stuff that um, we've been doing. I mean, how to use the site, et cetera, basically stuff I've been going over um, already. It has um, some inserted uh, pictures and stuff like that. So like here's information on logging in, et cetera, like that. So help is kind of information you might need for tips on searching or personalizing, et cetera. This is still under development too. We've had some significant changes to the admin site that we're still working on. So that's to come. Views, this is a really important new um, addition to um, the toolkit. Um, so views, you kind of, it's kind of most simply put is where you can go and set your preferences. Um, so you can go here and set preferences to um, how, what examples you want to display as open to already be open. So you don't have to click the button to show them open. You can choose to have that element reference piece always open. You can pick which policy statements you want to um, see when you're working in the toolkit and it sets, um, it allows you to pick also one that's your primary. So in the new toolkit, you won't, uh, you'll see the policy statements displayed in the right, um, in that right rail, as I discussed earlier. But you can only show one set of policy statements at a time. So you can only see LC policy statements. If you want to see music library policy statements and LC policy statements, you kind of have to look at them one at a time right now. Maybe down the line, we can figure out a way to allow you to display two at once, but um, right now it's only going to be one at a time. Um, and then you can choose to have the policy statements, your primary policy statements always open and displaying in that right rail. Here's where you can set your language. Um, this is where you set your access to a view. So this particular view, because I'm logged into my profile, is a private view. 
but there is a way through the admin site for um, staff administrators to go in and create a view for their institution, for their whole staff, and saying this is the view that I want you to use, and it can have default settings for examples and policy statements that you want them to look at, et cetera, like that. Um, and then finally, there's this template piece. Right now, the only template available is standard. But all these, part of this, a big part of this project was um, organizing how um, the back end uh, of the toolkit is structured, the architecture, and doing it in a way that will allow us to be more flexible going forward. So in the future, we'll be able to put in templates here that say, instead of RDA standard, maybe say RDA for legal librarians and it, our legal catalogers. And it'll allow you to go in and have a filtered um, view of uh, the RDA instructions for that particular type of work. And that's where those buttons, those next and previous buttons will come into play because then you can use those buttons in more of a workflow type way where you say, okay, I want to do this first. I want to deal with this element first, and then I'm going to go into the next element that's important to me, et cetera, et cetera. And the creation of these templates, um, you know, is, is down the line a bit, but um, it's something you might um, uh, hear talked about in um, other circles as kind of related to application profiles. Uh, way of dealing with policy statements, et cetera. It's just a way to re reorganize the instructions in a way that makes more sense for a particular type of um, work that a cataloger might be doing. So that's something that's in place now that we've got the architecture and the structure in place that we can build that uh, hopefully in the near future. Um, and then, of course, you can choose your language. It's only English language right now, but eventually you know, we'll have 10 different RDA will exist in 10 different languages, I think, by the time the um, toolkit, the beta site becomes the official toolkit. Okay, I'm running a little late, so I'm just going to go real quick through uh, bookmarks and documents. Here are the bookmarks and documents interface. This is where you can go in. Here's a folder where you can have bookmarks inside of it, and you can organize them. You can open them to edit. You can delete them. You can add a new folder. You can organize um, bookmarks and notes into the same folder. Etc. I think it's a pretty straightforward interface. Bookmarks and notes can only be shared locally or privately. They cannot be shared globally. And if through the new admin site, it is possible to turn off bookmarking, bookmarks and notes, um, local sharing of bookmarks and notes. So you don't have to have any fear of people cluttering up um, the, the display screen with stuff that other people really aren't that interested in. It's up to the institution. And then finally, documents. Documents is what we call, we used to call in the original tool site, they're called workflows or maps, but they're really just documents. Documents you can use in any way you want. They can link into the toolkit. We've made a couple um, significant changes on these. Uh, I'll show you the interface real quick. The biggest one is you can now add multiple authors. So it used to be the person who created the document in the toolkit was the only person who could edit it. Now a subscription, um, you know, a staff administrator can go in and assign a document to staff members, to a couple of staff members, say you guys work on this collaboratively, and you know only one person can actually edit in it at a time, but you know they can check it in and out basically, and they can say, hey, I just made a bunch of changes, why don't you go review them, and then that other person can get into the document and work on it too. Um, the interface is here. It can be expanded. You can do all the things you're used to doing. Again, it looks, I know, a little bit like a uh, ex uh, Word document, but it's really an HTML editor. Um, and these are all macros. So um, you can choose to work in the HTML if you like, if you're comfortable with it, by clicking that source button. Otherwise, you can you know, copy and paste a Word document into here, but it's going to get kind of goofy. <laughs> It's going to, um, the formatting make it a little messed up. So you should just be aware of that. Um, one of the other big features we added to this is, of course, with um, documents, you can choose to share them globally. That means with everyone who subscribes to the toolkit. So, and as you know from the original site, there's a lot of documents up there, and they're all just kind of in this big alpha list. 
Um, so what we've done is we've created this describe area where you'll be able to go and search for documents you're interested in and quote, subscribe to them so that those are the only ones that show up in your document collection folder. So you can subscribe by specific document or you can subscribe by institution. So if British Library did a bunch of documents you really like, you can just say, I'm gonna to subscribe to everything the British Library does and all their documents will show up in your collection. So those are a few more of the um, changes we've made to the toolkit. At this point, we've got 10 minutes left in the, um, the webinar, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Katie, do you have anything for me? Katie, I don't think you turned on your mic. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. So basically, we got a question. Is there an alphabetical list of relationships? designators on the base. Uh, no, there is not. There are no relationship designators. There are relationship elements. And right now, the only kind of quickest way to look at them is to go through that relationship matrix um, where you use a, um, you go by domain and then name. Again, um, we all recognize that this really isn't adequate. <laughs> um, for the user needs. And, and we found that this relationship matrix solution was not um, really working very well. So we're looking for a new approach to that. So that's something that's uh, a high priority for us right now. And then we have another question. What are application profiles? Um, application profiles, there's been a lot of discussion about it. Application profiles are a way of, a, uh, of approaching the is, is some kind of means of approaching the toolkit um, or the RDA content in a way that's designed for a specific need. So uh, the European um, RDA interest group did their own kind of straw man document of an application profile. And you could look at it, I don't have it handy right now, but I could maybe next time I do this, I'll pull it up or I have it handy. Um, it's really just a list of the elements and saying, okay, for a basic, say, single volume monograph, these are the elements I need to be sure to look at and address. And I want to address them with these options in mind. So you can say, I'm going to look at these elements and I'm going to apply, say, LC policy statements to them, which will tell me maybe which options I should apply or which ones I shouldn't. I should ignore, et cetera, like that. So it's just a way of um, kind of taking all these thousands of elements, et cetera, and organizing them in a way that makes them um, easier for the user to uh, navigate. So that's something that's in development. There are a lot of different approaches to uh, application profiles. I'll give a pitch that we're going to have a webinar on application profiles. It's part of our special topic series, I believe. Um, and if you go to the RDA toolkit site and, and, and look up the uh, orientation um, webinar series, um, you'll see it there and you can sign up for that one and learn a lot more about application profiles. And then Jamie, we have another question. If you subscribe to the institution's documents, does that mean no other documents will show up? Oh, no. Um, you, so this subscribe page that you're looking at right now, this will have all of the documents and you can actually search for um, institution or something like that. And you can pick which as many as you want. You can subscribe to British Library and Stanford and, you know, Texas, you know, whatever institutions that are putting things up that you find useful. And you can subscribe to them as institutions or you can subscribe to them as uh, individual documents. It's whatever you choose. Those are all the questions that have come in so far. Okay. I'll give just a moment, see if there are any other questions. All righty. Um, well, I thank everyone for attending. I hope this was useful. Um, 
like I said, we're going to repeat these. We'll probably be back in September doing this again, and um, we'll record this and post it. We have recorded this, and we'll post it up on um, our YouTube site. I might mention um, the YouTube site's linked from our Drupal site, our, our main RDA toolkit.org site. And um, I would recommend that it has um, more videos on specific uh, how to do specific things in the toolkit. And it goes into a little bit more of um, cataloging issues as well for folks who might be interested. So um, do um, check that out and um, let people know if you found this interesting that they should um, come check us out in September. All right. Thank you very much.